Yeah, I'm happy to kick off. Uh, I'll start with Ben firstly. Congratulations. Um, when was that moment when you got the call from Eddie and you were in the squad and what was your re initial reaction? Yeah, no, thank you uh, to start with. Um, it was on, when was it, Wednesday. Um, so we got sent home from the Bledisloe camps and had to train Tuesday, Wednesday in our uh, hub in Sydney. Uh, got a call Wednesday, Arvo, from uh, uh, Webby, the manager, um, just letting, this, well, letting me know that I, I made the squad and um, yeah, it was awesome to hear that call. Um, obviously, a lot of nerves, um, knowing that a phone call is coming and you're not sure if you're going to be in or not. But yeah, just over the moon to be able to represent uh, our country at a World Cup, and um, yeah, very excited for the next couple of months. Listeners and the utility throughout this sort of rugby championship, can you talk us through how much of your training you spent at ten or fifteen, or maybe at any other position you've been sort of filling in? Yeah, no, just just ten and fifteen. Um, done a fair bit of both. Um, obviously probably seen through Super Rugby and stuff, I've played a fair bit of 10 and 15. Um, and as Eddie said to me, um, it's it's a good quality to have, especially in a World Cup year, um, covering more than one position. Um, so yeah, I've just been really focusing on uh, wherever that may be at training. It's been a bit at 10, a bit at 15. And um, yeah, just really trying to um, just help the team in those two positions where I can. I guess outside of yourself and Carter, there's no one else in the squad which has experience at 10 at Super Rugby level, let alone test level. Um, is that sort of an expectation that you think you're going to be um, really feeling in that training, particularly sort of focusing on 10 heading forward? Or what's that conversation been like? Yeah, as you say, it's just mainly me and Carter here now, um, the two 10s. And I had a good sit down with Eddie uh, yesterday around that. And um, yeah, he said uh, for, the, for the majority, I'll be training at 10 and um, looking at me at 10. Um, so yeah, I'll just be working with Carter and working with the coaches to really, you know, put our best foot forward and drive the team around. Obviously, as you say, you know, we're both young, but uh, we're both very confident in that position and um, yeah, we feel like we, we can do a good job. Hey Ben, congratulations, mate. Um, we spoke after you got picked in that April squad camp and you sort of said you weren't sure if you'd done enough to make that squad. Was it any different going into this one? Like, how did that compare having been with the squad throughout the year? Yeah, a little bit of a difference. Obviously, um, in that very first squad, I hadn't really played to the potential that I wanted to. I knew I had more in me. Um, but then it's a bit different. You know, you make these squads, and we've been with the squad now for six weeks, and I feel like I've been training really well, um, even though I haven't played yet. Um, I feel like I've been making good strides, and I've been getting some good uh, feedback from the coaches. So, um, you know, there's still that uh, bit of uncertainty coming into a new squad, into a World Cup. Um, you know, that confidence is always there, and the belief... Um, and yeah, I'm just extremely grateful and, and stoked to be uh, picked and a part of it now. You've obviously got in camp now and spoken with a lot of the other players. How would you describe the general feeling about the squad? The Australian public have seen that and there was a lot of what seemed to be surprises. What was the play? Yeah, you talk, talk to the guys. Like, What was the general vibe around that 33? Yeah, obviously there was a few surprises. Like there's, you can't hide that. There's a few surprises coming in. Um, but you know... It's a, it's a reasonably young squad, uh, a lot of experience still, but a reasonably young squad and, you know, we're all just uh, extremely ambitious, you know, we, we believe we can, you know, win the World Cup and um, no matter who's in the squad, we all, we all know that we're here to do, to do one job and um, yeah, everyone's confident, everyone knows they're here for a reason now, like Eddie, Eddie's a very smart coach, he's, he's done a lot um, around the world in, in different teams and he obviously knows what he's doing, he's got a plan and um, yeah, the boys back him and the boys back each other, so we're just really excited. And I mean, one of those selections was obviously not quite not being there. Um, so much debate around that. Um, as, as one of those tens who is there, like, how do you deal with all that noise around that? Yeah, it's it's always, you know, in the back of your mind. Um, you know, try not to read too much of social media or, or anything like that. Um, but, you know, you can get caught up in that pretty easily. But, you know, obviously someone like Quaid, his calibre, you know, he's, he's been there, he's done that. He's He's been great for myself and Carter over the past six weeks and we've taken a lot from him and, um, I guess now it's just uh, shifting our, our mindset into uh, using all of that knowledge that we've got from him, um, building into the World Cup, because um, as you say, it's just myself and Carter now, and uh, we're the two who can drive this team forward. And um, yeah, if we, if we worry too much about the outside noise, um, you know, all that stuff's going to creep in, so we can just put our full focus in, onto the footy, and um, yeah, we should be right. Dan, you mentioned uh, the feedback you got from the coaches. Um, well, how, how does that work? Is it, what sort of things do you get told? Do you, you know, do you, do you get told what's working well, what's not working well, what you need to improve? Is it is it a is it a two way dialogue? Just trying to get an idea of like how Eddie interacts with individuals. Like how how do you 
find out where you're sitting and to what you have to do to get your name read out? Yeah, it's to be honest, you don't really get too much uh, unless you unless you go to them and seek a bit of feedback during the week. Um, and then once the team's announced, uh, Eddie kind of encourages you to go and see him if you're not picked. Um, and he'll sit down with you and he'll give you that, that feedback. And if it's positive, it's positive. And then he always gives you a couple of work-ons as well. Obviously, if you're not getting picked, there's there's going to be a reason around that. Um, but yeah, there, for me personally, there has been a lot of positives, which have been good. Um, and then just a few little things to keep working on um, to get myself into the team. Is there one bit of advice or tip or recommendation that Eddie gave you that has helped you improve and you think might have got you over the line? Um, probably just one thing around my communication and just really driving driving the boys around the field, whether that's at fullback from the back or at 10. Um, and I guess being able to play those two positions, you know, probably helps, like Eddie said, in a World Cup year, um, just filling in wherever it may, may fit to help the team. Um, but yeah, my biggest thing was really just getting my hands on the ball as much as possible um, and then just that communication, just really even though I'm still somewhat of a young head, just really driving the boys around the team. And I feel like I've done that quite well in the past six weeks. The nature of your role is that you actually could come on at a really pivotal time um, to decide a really major match, no pressure, right? Um, are, you, are you prepared for that? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I suppose, you know, you play rugby to, to be in those moments and to win, to win games for your team and um, to be in those moments with your teammates and... I guess a lot of the training we've done under Eddie has been, you know, scenario based and like, you know, pressure moments, different scenarios around stuff that you're talking about. Uh, end of games, start of games, need to chase a game, need to close out a game. So I feel like at the moment we're, we're really well suited to that. Um, and as I said before, you know, training at 10 and 15, you're, you're the man who usually has to ride those, those moments. And um, yeah, just through our training at the moment, I feel like um, we're pretty well prepared and uh, we've got a long, long way to go to the World Cup, so I think we'll be, we'll be good when we get there. Uh, ben, have you had any, um, any contact with Quaid at all? Obviously, as a, a senior guy, who you were probably picking the brain of um, in camp, and he's um, one of the unfortunate people that's missed out. Has, has he reached out to say congrats or anything since the squad was announced? No, I haven't actually. He, he sent a message into our players' group chat just to say congrats to all the boys, but um, nothing, nothing individually so far. Um, Zane, for yourself, being you know, sitting here in the Wallabies camp, about to head to a World Cup, what does this mean for you? Um, yeah, obviously it's um, huge for me. Um, you know, it's every little uh, kid's dream to play for the Wallabies and represent your country, and especially in a World Cup. So just being able to um, be selected for the squad is you know, it's huge for me. Ben kind of talked about the feedback that he's been getting from Eddie, and you know, when you, you're missing out, going to him, and he's giving you pointers. What's the big things from him and those forwards coaches that you're really trying to implement into your game that's sort of got you back into this fold? Um, well, obviously, um, as a tight head prop, the first thing you got to worry about is set piece and scrumming. And um, I've had a lot of conversations about our, our forwards coaches with that, and how I can improve and um, keep learning with that. And then just around the park, you know, Eddie's been real big about setting early and working hard. You know, never um, missing a beat and just getting to every um, everything early at every opportunity you get. So that's been something he's been really driving um, for me as well, just to be um, early into contact, to get set and early into D-line. So, yeah. And he's seen guys like Alan go down and Tanny. I mean, these would have been two guys you would have been almost idolising growing up, coming through the ranks. What does it mean to this group, um, as firstly, for those guys to be, I guess, Alan to be out? And then secondly, how do you go about trying to really fill the void that he leaves? Obviously, you never want to see, um, you know, your teammates and people you care about get hurt. So, you know, when he went, uh, got injured, it was pretty um, devastating. Like, it was emotional for, for um, a lot of the boys because he's a really big, you know, part of the team. He was he's a leader and, you know, he's um, guided he guided me through, um, you know, that South Africa game. You know, he helped me uh, a lot there. But, you know, even with Nella seeing him get um, hurt, you know, but both of them being injured sometimes leaves, um, yeah, a pretty big void. But unless all I do is, um, you know, work hard and, just know my job and do it to the best of, of my ability and keep working hard and hopefully I can fill that role and you know do my part for the team. Dane, where were you when you found out the good news? Who was the first phone call? Um, yeah, I was just at home on the Gold Coast, um, chilling with a few mates and um, yeah, I was pretty nervous but got the call from Webby and yeah, I think the first person I called was my mum. 
So yeah, that was a pretty good moment for me and her. A question for both of you. It's obviously so much more than the player. Like your family is so involved in your careers today. Will they try and get over to France? What, what, what's that like sharing that moment with them at such a pivotal moment in your, your careers? Yeah, it's obviously very, very special. You know, people always say, you know, your family and your parents do a lot for you growing up, take you to train, take you to games, and they they ride the whole ride with you, the highs and the lows. And, um, yeah, like like Zane, I, I called my dad first, and he was he was stoked. He was over the moon. And, um, yeah, it's just a surreal moment letting your family know that you're going to a World Cup. And, you know, as a kid, you grow up wanting to be at these things. The World Cup is the biggest, biggest stage in rugby. So, you know, everyone's over the moon. Um and yeah, um, hopefully they can get over there and, and celebrate and um, you know be there for the journey as well because it'd be an awesome experience. Same. Sorry, question about front row from a bloke who never played in the front row. Um, there's this idea that you know the, the the best front rowers are all older blokes because I don't know maybe the older you get, the better you get at cheating and hiding things from the referees. What? Why? Why? Why is there this idea that you have to be older to be um, experienced enough to play in the front row? And conversely, what do younger props like you and Angus bring to the table that maybe the old sea legs don't have? Um, honestly, I think it's just because they have, you know, they obviously have scrummed a lot more. They get more time in scrums, in games, in training. You know, they pick up those little tricks and, um, yeah, little things they can do in a scrum to get an advantage or... You know, just to, I guess, be better at it. I think that comes from experience and, you know, um, playing games, going through those scrums and repping it in training and just figuring out what works, what doesn't work, uh, you know, what to do when you feel pressure from certain areas. So, I mean, yeah, I think definitely a lot of things you can learn from um, just doing it, but also learning, being able to talk to them and learn from them in training is a uh, big help. Like, you know, obviously Slips is very experienced. And um, you know he he can t uh, really teach us, you know what to do and adapt in those situations. And same with um, the hookers and tight other tight ends we have. You know they give us, given me a lot of pointers on how to adapt. Um, you know in pressure moments. And I guess um, for the young boys like me and um, Belly and even uh, Shoppy, I think we can bring a lot of energy. You know working around the park, and um, yeah, just like Eddie's been um, driving, getting set early, bringing that energy and especially. If some of us coming off the bench, really taking it up a step when we get on the field and get our opportunity to um, play. Is the difference between Northern and, and Southern Hemisphere packing in scrums really different or is it just marginally different? And, and what are the differences? Um, I think it would be uh, very different, obviously. Um, a lot of the Northern Hemisphere rugby is, a lot of the forwards are a lot bigger and um, they play a lot more uh, power games, so it's going to be interesting to verse up against scrums like that. You know, I haven't personally played against the Northern Hemisphere team yet, but, you know, for all the feedback I've got from them is that it's a real, you know, it's a real challenge at set piece and you have to be on every single time at set piece. So you can't go in there even half a percent after. You have to give it your all every single time. Is there one bit of advice you've been given from anyone throughout your career recently or even when you were just a young fella starting out that, um, that, that you've carried right through? Um, I think one piece of advice I got, um, and it, you know, I've heard it a lot of times every time I go into a, a new team, is um, you can never stop learning with scrums. No matter how, um, how many times you've scrummed, how many times you think you know, you're, you've got it nailed, you can always um, you know, pick up on new tricks and you can always keep learning in a scrum because it's something you know, a lot of people have trouble with and it's really hard to, I guess, master it. And, you, know, you can always just keep learning in that area. Hey, hey Ben, um, Maxi Jorgensen yesterday said it was extremely hot and he was in the hurt locker even though he's not doing full training as someone who is up there. Can you shed a bit of light of what training is looking like in um, the heat of Darwin? Yeah, he's not wrong. It was very, very hot. Um, had a good session yesterday and a good session uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, a lot around what, what Zane's talking about, you know, working hard off the ball, um, working hard, you know, get set early uh, in defence and attack. Um, Eddie's really putting us through our paces, a lot of conditioning, uh, conditioning based games straight into a bit of set piece stuff, um, you know, just working us under fatigue, because um, obviously you don't get many chances to, to train at this, at this heat, <clears throat> um, so it's just a really good opportunity to, 
to put us in different game scenarios, like I was talking about before, under that fatigue and um, in, in the heat. Um, but it's been unreal. You know, the boys have really embraced it. Uh, the boys have got around each other, and we had a really good session um, yesterday and this morning. Um, but, yeah, it is, it is very hot up here. Uh, question for, for either of you guys, um, uh, but Zane, I think maybe particularly you as, as one of the younger guys in the squad, what's your earliest World Cup memory as a young rugby fan or, or your favourite memory that, that you watch? So, you know, not not um, having looked at highlights or old videos of 91 or 99 or something like something you remember sort of viewing or witnessing. Um, my, um, I don't know if it's my earliest, but it's always the first one that comes to mind. Uh, in 2015, I was lucky enough to go on a, on a World Cup tour with uh, my club on the Gold Coast, and we, me and my family, we watched the um, Australia versus England game at Twickenham when Australia beat England, and um, yeah, that was that's a pretty good memory for myself. You know, you got um, Gitto scoring that try in the corner, and um, so it was um, so did Adam Ashley Cooper. So it was a pretty good, cool uh, game to be uh, to watch, and yeah, I think that's the most fun memory to have. What's it like now knowing that you're in the same squad and potentially going to pack down alongside James Slipper, who was playing in that game, which is your favourite memory um, from rug, uh, World Cup rugby? Um, yeah, it's obviously it's surreal. Like like I said, you know, it's every kid's dream to play a World Cup. And, um, you know, um, as much as, you know, it's a great experience and, you know, it's a surreal experience, you just got to put your head down and work and um, do whatever you can to... Um, I guess try and be ready for that moment and prepare for it, and so you can um, be the best in that uh, moment when you can. Bono, do you have a, a particularly fond um, rugby world cup memory? To be honest, I was going to say the exact same game um, from that world cup. You know, just watching that game and how how well the boys played and how they beat England in in England. Um, yeah, I just I just remember watching. You know, I think it was Bernard, Drew Mitchell. Um, Swoop, all those boys carving up that game, and um, just to see the the excitement on their face to actually win a game like that um, and, and progress into the tournament uh, really stood out to me. And um, yeah, hopefully that's something that we can uh, replicate this year.